Here it is, where it all began, in an old truck on a farm road in Dallas, Texas. I started playing with Matt Hillier in 1991 in a band called the Red Devils. The Red Devils bass player Jason Burns quit at the, at the rehearsal that I was joining the band at, so immediately we needed a new bass player. We started off by playing a lot of house parties up in Denton, Texas. There was a label out of Chicago that was interested in doing some stuff with the Red Devils, so we packed up and headed up to Chicago for some shows. And I think that was probably the first like big road trip I'd ever been on playing music. I think it was on that Chicago trip where Steve and I started looking at each other and just realizing that there was so, so much more that we could be doing with that music. We had already seen Big Sandy and the Fly Right Trio and the Dave and Deke combo and realized those guys were already masters of their craft. And we weren't even close. Um, we weren't even in that world yet. But we also knew with some effort we could maybe get there. It also became apparent to me that the only original songs in the Red Devils were ones that I wrote and I wanted more focus on original music. When I first started playing guitar, my brother and I and all of our friends, we were all into punk rock. My brother took a trip to London and he brought back these Psychobilly records. And it really just blew my mind. My mom being hip and cool like she is, she pulled me to the side and said, if you like this psychobilly music, you should really check out rockabilly music. My mom hooked me up with her and my dad's old 45s, and uh, there was stuff like Eddie Cochran in there, and I just dove right into it and started researching that style of music. I loved it so much. Growing up in San Antonio the 70s and 80s, we had music around the house. We had Johnny Horton on vinyl, George Jones, Buck Owens, Bob Wills, Patsy Cline. So even going into it as a youngster, man, I, I felt that uh, I appreciated that music even then. So then in the mid 80s, when I was in high school, Dwight Yoakam came out. I thought that was amazing. Honky Tonk Man is a single, a Johnny Horton song. Well, I'm a honky tonk man. Ain't a crazy 
Love to give the girls a world to the music of an old goodbye. The first band I ever had was a band called Matt the Cat and the Gutter Rats that my brother and I started, and he was on drums and I played guitar. We put it together because we wanted to play the talent show. <laughs> There was an older guy that went to my school named John McNabb who called me one time and he said, hey, a bunch of us are going to see the Reverend Horton Heat. My dad decided he would take me to the show. I made up my mind a long time ago. Anyone who's been around the Texas music scene knows that the Reverend Horton Heat was a pillar of the North Texas music culture. No one can deny Jim Heat's incredible skill as a guitar player and a band leader. There weren't a lot of bands that were actually playing rockabilly music that you could go see, so for me to see them do that just blew me away. They took a break and I walked up to introduce myself to Jim and I'm sure it looked kind of funny because most of my clothes were like two sizes too big at that time and I introduced myself I said, hey, I'm Matt the Cat. It's kind of stupid, but um, who knew it would be a friendship that, that lasts to this day. kid and I don't know if, I don't know how old he was he looked like he was 12 but he had the coolest pompadour I'd ever seen and he had this cool looking 50s shirt and jeans and he was wearing these creepers that had some I think they had leopard skin ins, uh, inserts in them and they I was like well whoa, this kid's cool and uh, I said hi you know I'm Jimmy he said hi I'm Matt the cat <laughs> it was pretty funny, and I thought that it was awesome because uh, to have to, to see a young kid that was into rockabilly, and that was probably around 1986 to 87. And by that time, rockabilly especially was just like it was, might as well have been from outer space. It was so far from the mainstream, and even far from the alternative scene, and even music writers didn't know what rockabilly was. It was not relevant in any way, shape perform to commercial music, you know, and so to have a young kid that was showing interest in that, I was thinking, now oh, that's really cool. I think that same gig, that same night, a famous local promoter in Dallas, Angus Wynn, was there and introduced me to Ronnie Dawson, who was one of the, had some of the best records in the 50s of rockabilly and blues as under the name Commonwealth Jones and Ronnie D and and Ronnie Dawson had a great career after that but uh, it's kind of an interesting night I met Matt the, Matt the Cat and Ronnie Dawson the same the same <laughs> In 1990, so I would have been 17 or 18, and it was my very first band. I put an ad in, I guess, the Dallas Observer looking for bandmates, and a guy named Rebel answered, and he had a band called the Dallas Dive Bombers. And so after I talked to Rebel for a while, he kind of volunteered some of the guys in his band to join forces with me. And so that was Rebel, his brother Ace, and Steve Berg on bass. The music was uh, pretty much just straight up three chord rock and roll. My biggest influence at the time was Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. So I was kind of looking for Blackhearts, I guess. And um, 
Steve and the band that he was in, the Dallas Dive Bombers, fit that bill perfectly. So listening back the couple times that I was able to find cassettes of that, um, that time, it was very heavy rockabilly, like more than I, I think I realized. Like I didn't know that I was in a rockabilly band, but I was. <laughs> Steve Berg and I have been working together for a long time, and I love this guy, you know. Uh, we've been through uh, more things that I probably shouldn't talk about. I love the guy. He, he, he puts his heart into what he does, and he, he works harder than just about anybody. And um, we, we got the same sort of sense about the way things, the way we like things to go musically. And I'm glad that we've, we've been able to stick together for as long as we have and sort of look out for one another and do, and do cool music. It's fun. The thing about Matt that is unique is that he went to the Arts Magnet High School. And like the New Bohemians and Erica Badu and Nora Jones and, and uh, everybody who went to that school, that gave him a really rich kind of exposure to all kinds of different kinds of music. Being that close to Deep Ellum and that close to the Deep Ellum music scene, a lot of kids from Arts Magnet just make that jump, and that's what Matt did. All of a sudden, with Matt the Cat and the Gutterites, I found myself surrounded by some really good songwriters, and like Jim Heath and Monty Warden, and, and they were really good mentors to me. For a minute there, it kind of seemed like Matt the Cat and the Gutterites was going to go someplace, because I, I had a manager at the time, and she was getting people signed to major record deals. My first day of high school was significant to me for three reasons. First of all, it was my first day of high school. Second of all, I had to get on a plane and fly down to Austin to do a showcase for Tony Brown of MCA Records. But it was also the day that Steve Ray Vaughan died. In the car on the way to the airport, my mother told me that Stevie Ray Vaughan died. I was really, really upset. And the people who picked me up at the airport in Austin, they were all like family to him. So I was just surrounded by like overwhelming sadness. The show was not good. Um, I tanked it. Um, but I don't, I don't really know how it could have been good. I got a call a few days later from my manager and she really laid into me. And she told me, oh, you'll never play lead guitar on your own records, and you need to sign this publishing deal if you want to keep working together. And, um, I don't know. I felt like I, I, I blew it. Um, but I also felt like, you know, I'm, I'm only 15, and I'm just now learning to write songs. You know, what do you want from me, you know? So we parted ways. There was this woman uh, in Austin named Carlin Major, and uh, she and her husband, George, uh, owned and operated Soap Creek Saloon, which was a legendary outlaw Texas club. Willie played there, Waylon, Doug Somm, Freddie Fender. And uh, then Carlin went into artist management in the late 70s, I think, maybe. But she, this woman, she had the best eye and ear for raw talent of anybody I have ever seen. And, and not a lot of people know who she is, but she had a string of getting her acts, and, and once again, contemporaneous to 1979 through 1990, uh, th there, there was no major label action in Texas, really, except for the acts that Carlin Major signed, with the exception of Willie Nelson, of course. Carlin had uh, an incredible reputation of finding talent right away, and I think that actually played against... Uh, Matt at the time, because um, Matt was now like, I think, 16. Tony Brown was in town cutting something for the Thelma and Louise soundtrack. Tony Brown, who was the head of MCA Records at the time in Nashville, Hall of Fame producer, to, to see Matt. And I remember telling Carlin exactly what I said was, I was farther along at 16 than Matt is now, and I wasn't ready at 16. He's not ready right now. And you'll be doing him a disservice to showcase him right now. Lone Star Trio. Our first show was at the Three Teardrops Tavern in Dallas, Texas. What a wonderful place. Towns Van Zant, Chris Wall, Junior Brown, Gary P. Nunn. A lot of my favorite bands played there. I wanna go home with the army. It would be considered.
considered similar to the Continental Club, except bigger and more country. You know, they would do their thing on Fridays with the free food, you know, come get your uh, Friday happy hour uh, food and cheap drinks and just stay for the Friday night. So talk about a sketchy area of town to come do the, the country music show. Yeah. Like this used to be sketch. Oh yeah, so this is it right here, huh? Right here. This was the big room, and over there was the, Golly, not the big room, uh, this place in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, it predated uh, so much of what we know today as the regional Texas music scene, Red Dirt, whatever, predated the Texas singer-songwriter movement. Uh, Roy Ashley used to do his radio show from 4 to 6 on KNON live from the Three Teardrops Tavern. It was just sort of a legendary hour of, of uh, Texas radio back in the day. You'd be seeing Gary P. Nunn, Chris Wall, uh, Bill Kirchin, uh early first, like the derailers, first shows outside of Austin were here. Um, Ronnie Dawson with uh, Lone Star Trio here. Monty Warden from the Wagoneers put together a, a new band and he came up to play at the Three Teardrops Tavern and he needed an opening band. We didn't have a, a name or anything. So we called ourselves the Ten High Trio and that was 1990, 91, no, 90, 92 or 93. Anyways, uh, we put together a little set. Our drummer came back around. It was the first time that we got back together with him after the Red Devils. And uh, it was just a really cool place. It was, I remember there was a country artist, Johnny Duncan, who was standing in line to pay his cover at the door as I was walking in. And uh, Monty recognized him and he's like, holy, holy crap, Johnny Duncan's coming to pay to see the show. And I thought that was cool. They had a little record store up front that was that was also cool. Just I don't know. The whole place was decked out in a really cool way. We weren't playing here, and if we didn't have a gig on Friday, I would be here. I said I've driven by here like a bunch of times trying to figure out which which one it was, and I wouldn't have had this peg. kind of became our our little home and we would play here every chance we got did a lot of sh sort of all-day festival shows with guys like Gary P. Nunn and Ronnie Spears and uh, uh, Mark David Manders Tommy Alverson the three teardrops tavern filled a gap between the popular tailgate country of the Garth Brooks era and the only other thing that might have been going on which was the house bands the country discos the way that the music scene was developing at the Three Teardrops Tavern was ahead of its time in many ways. The walk from the parking lot across the street into the venue uh, felt sh shady, for sure. But I mean, once you once you got inside, you're, it was like you were coming home. The trip, like when, when talking about, hey, name some places down here. You know, name half a dozen places, and as we drive around, you know, every other building is a place we did something. That's right. Stick around long enough. Up here, man, this is kind of a ghost town. It looks like it used to be. That was Chumley's. Like the first, of course, yeah. Dave's Art Pawn Shop was was the only place that like underage kids like me could go and just hang out in Deep Ellum and drink bottomless cups of coffee. And I'm sure that's probably what did them in business-wise. Sounds the same, like a lucrative business model. Yeah, but the same dude opened this place, Chumley's, and it was kind of a cool cool spot. That's where we played with Ronnie Dawson, Max, Mac Curtis, and Sid, Sid and Billy King. Yeah. Then, of course, I guess it was just the th two doors down was became the tea room, which, boy, that was, that was a cool spot. The Gypsy Tea Room was one of the first places that we ever played a show outside of eight airs that show might have been the one with leon russell leon russell yeah man. we played with him man that was pretty sweet yeah that was a pretty on the, pretty on the big deal. stage yeah lone star trio worked really well in country bars because we weren't just playing rockabilly music we played a lot of early honky tonk and country music as well you know as we drive through deep ellum a place with a rich history uh, just the physical venues and the spots that we used to play at, like this place right here, the old Naomi's location. 
and that was one of the first places we could even get a gig. I remember it being just a really cool place, you know, because it was like a like a clubhouse for Texas singer songwriters at the time. And I, the night that we played, the guy Carol Collier who owned the joint, he wanted to do a Friday night fish fries and do it every every night and have bands in the courtyard on the side. And so we were one of the first ones that he tried that theory out on and it nobody showed up until they did and the people who showed up was this loud boisterous group of uh, guys in cowboy hats and at the center of it was this guy Mark David Manders and his whole crew bought every single cassette tape we had on us which is how we you know were making any kind of money selling cassette tapes and we became lifelong friends. It just, you know, that was sort of our entrance, uh, our introduction into that whole Texas singer-songwriter world. We became friends. We were introduced to so many people through through that crew. Good old Naomi's. That really is where a bunch of this started. They don't dial 911 there. Naomi, I love you. Because I was younger at the time and, and I had a band and I played guitar, I would go to Guitar Center or anywhere else uh, where other people were guitar enthusiasts. And I would always hear about this kid, this Matt the Cat Hillier guy. Uh, rockabilly at the time in Dallas was this big thing. And I don't know if it was, it was like that in other major cities, but we had the Reverend Horton Heat um, that was sort of the guy that was getting out and touring and being the ambassador to sort of the Dallas scene on a larger scale. He was on Sub Pop Records. Uh, which at the time, this is the early 90s, was the sort of bastion of, of grunge music. And, and, and Jim Heath and the Reverend Horn Heath were a psychabilly band. So they were sort of doing the punk rockabilly mashup. And uh, I went to go see them. And he brings up this kid that looked like he was like nine years old at the time. And so I was just blown away by this kid because he's holding his own with Jim Heath, who was like the guitar legend of Dallas at the time and just doing this mind-blowing stuff. Well, my band Hackers at the time, we got asked to play a show out in Carrollton, and I forget the name of the place, but it was like this sort of beach-themed where there was volleyball and people with like in their shorts, and then there was a food that was probably just shitty bar food, and dumb music and then they had bands and so the coolest thing about it is like they asked us to play but uh matt the cat hillier's band uh the lone star trio were going to be on the show and so we we're like, great we get to actually know these guys and they played and it was everything we we, we we'd sort of been hearing about and i was and it was everything i'd heard about with with matt and i was just blown away by this kid <laughs> Lone Star Trio was a three-piece rockabilly band. Things happened pretty quick for us, and it wasn't long before Ronnie Dawson signed us up to be his backing band. Hello, I'm Ronnie Dawson. And I'm living proof that rockabilly is here to stay. Ronnie Dawson took us to San Francisco for one of our first road trips, and that was when Matt was still in high school. Tattoo artist Sam Chamberlain and myself took the rental van out to San Francisco while Matt finished up his last day of school at Arts Magnet, Booker T in Dallas. Matt got on a plane, we scooped him up, and uh, what a great way to do a first tour.
so there was a, a new club that was opened up in Orange County, California called Linda's Dollhouse. I put it in her ear. I said, hey, there's this young guy in Dallas, Matt Hillier. You should really get him out here because they're really great and they're young. And I was convinced, as I am today, that the way music works is by the band's touring. So even if you get a big record deal, you have to get in a van and go tour, or in their case, a crazy car, a station wagon, or whatever. I really wanted Matt to understand that if you're going to do this, you've got to get out there and play. And sure enough, they did it. Him and Steve got a, that crazy, ratty station wagon and, uh, and toured America. But getting out to the West Coast was important at the time because the West Coast was really ground zero for the rockabilly, the, the main rockabilly scene in the U.S. Jim was telling me about this friend of his that has a, a band and how young and exciting they were and they really wanted to get out to California and how the doll hut would have been a perfect place for them to play. So I remember he handed me Matt's number on a scratch of paper and, you know, yeah, take care of these guys. Um, and then I'm not sure how much longer after that week or two, maybe. Um, I think maybe I called Matt and then he called me back, but um, he was young. Uh, I remember, I'm going to miss my high school graduation to come out and play in California. And so I booked him. It was amazing. Lone Star Trio was just babies in that hilarious station wagon. You had to use string on the windshield wipers to get it through a storm, which was really pretty funny. The first time I heard a Lone Star Trio, Lisa Umbarger, who was the bass player for the Toadies back then, had seen them somewhere and told us how badass they were. So around about that time, I think we had just signed with Interscope Records and their publicity person came into town and was going to do little interviews with us to uh, write a bio to come out with our album. We took her to this little club called The Rhythm Room. And so while we're speaking to this uh, lady for our bio, Lone Star Trio is playing. It took forever to get the bio written because we kept stopping and watching the band. After we finished doing the interview for the bio, we went up and introduced ourselves to the band and mentioned we might want to play some shows or do stuff in the future. I don't know how much longer after that, but um, we had our record release party at Trees when Rubberneck came out and the opening act was Lone Star Trio. And it was amazing, like sold out, probably the biggest crowd we'd ever played to at that time. And we've kind of been, you know, friends ever since. They had a drummer at the time uh, that really just wasn't working out and, and kind of didn't want to be there. And they had started touring at this point because every band in Dallas, our pedigree was like, we all toured, we all went out, we all did stuff. Um, and back then, this was before cell phones, so you'd find pay phone or you would you know use somebody's phone at, that you were staying on sleeping on their floor hey can I use your phone I swear it's not long distance and that's how you stayed in touch with your friends and they called me and my brother and I had met a guy years before uh before we were even living in Dallas we lived in a town called Sherman Texas and we would go down to Dallas on the weekends and we had met this guy that was really 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 into metal metal like thrash metal death metal and 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 super like double kick drum and we knew that our buddies you know in the Lone Star Trio were out and kind of dealing with a drummer that wasn't really working out didn't really want to be there and again you know and Dallas at the time the psychobilly thing was happening the sort of convergence of punk and and uh, rockabilly and we ran back into this guy and at this point the guy had cut his hair and he kind of had the the style that, that Matt and all the buddies were were sort of donning at the time and my brother and I were like this could totally work we found out Chris was going to audition and we were like Christmas. We could not wait. We were just waiting for the phone call. We're like, God, I hope it works out. I hope it works out. And we got the call like after he left that Matt and uh, Steve loved him. Obviously the first time that we played together, 
they knew I wasn't, I wasn't like a traditional kind of rockabilly type player, you know, using 5A sticks and brushes. I came from a rock background and I think that that's what I know. I know personally Matt got, got excited about that because it was like, hey, we can play roots influence music. And to be honest, I was just like coming from my kind of hard rock metal background. First time I heard Reverend Horton Heat, I was like, I was like, Taz Bentley is the coolest fucking drummer ever. He's doing this kind of music, but he's adding, you know, metal chops and rock chops. And I'd never heard anything like that. And it was distinctly Texas. And there was something really cool about it. And so me being, you know, 20 years old going, well, hell, I, I could probably do that. When, you know, I joined Lone Star Trio, that was kind of, that, that was definitely where I was coming from musically, from a musical perspective. I wanted to play this type of music, but add my own kind of, you know, hey, I listen to Metallica and Slayer and Sepultura and all this stuff. And is there a way to tastefully, or maybe not so tastefully, integrate those influences and still be true to what the music is as it's written and as, as it should be? Finally, there was somebody who wanted to be in the band. That energy made us feel like now we are three. Still to this day, the loudest drummer I've ever played with. We rehearsed a metric fuck ton. Um, I mean, five days a week. That was our gig. You know, regardless of what we did, we were, and it was always daytime. And there was, I just remember this, this, this period of like just crazy creativity. And Matt was just writing his ass off. <laughs> Living on my street and all I want is to treat her sweet like the wear diamond rings and expensive furs. Now I wanna get close to her. So I received a call from a local promoter with an idea to start a Roots Rockabilly Festival, something that had never really been done in Southern California before. He didn't even have a name for it at the time, but knew I had deep connections with a lot of those kind of bands and asked if I wanted to help him put it together. So um, obviously my top bands, Big Sandy and uh, Russell Scott and his Red Hots, and of course Lone Star Trio, I had to call my boys in Texas and say, you got to get out here. This is a big deal. When they said, hey, we're going to go to California, I'm like, on tour? Like, go to a different state and play drums? For money or for no money? <laughs> It was out in Irvine, a um, place called Oak Canyon Ranch. I think anywhere between eight and 10,000 people in attendance the first year. And it was really one of a kind, a car show, vendors, two stages. I had a Linda's Doll Hut stage, and then we had a big stage. And I think it was a great time for Lone Star Trio. They really just shined. And it was amazing how quickly all of those fans of those other local bands just attached themselves to Lone Star and couldn't wait for them to come back out and perform. So uh, they're pretty much a staple on the Hootenanny for several years. I was like 21 years old and in California with my guys and we're playing music and fuck, I'm gonna eat today and I can buy a pack of smokes. I've made it, you know? <laughs> You're like, I've got like four pair of drumsticks to get through, you know, 
the next 10 days. Okay. You know. Lone Star Trio came in hot. Regionally, locally, things were happening for us. We'd go out west, do uh, L.A., Orange County, San Francisco, and things were happening for us out there. The better we do on the west coast, the better things were when, when we would come back to town. The scene started growing around Lone Star Trio. We needed some product, so I would sit in world history in high school. When I was supposed to be taking notes, I would, I would write songs instead. And I wrote most of the songs in the Lone Star Trio CD in class when I was supposed to be paying attention. In many ways, it seemed like we were playing both sides of the coin. The country venues, such as Naomi's, Three Teardrops Tavern, were places we do really well. Uh, at the same time, Trees, Orbit Room, and the rock places in Dallas, we do really well there too. years of touring with Lone Star Trio, I think there was a point where the writing was on the wall for us. Back when I was booking the Lone Star Trio gigs, he'd send out a promo picture that showed three dudes with an upright bass and a hollow body guitar. They'd think it was some quiet uh, jazz trio that could set up in the corner and play to the ketchup bottles, and then we'd show up. You can never hear the bass or the vocals, and that's, that's a problem. I felt like we were a little bit limited. During those times, we had a show in Fort Worth and Steve had been out in Central Texas riding his motorcycle for a few days. I think Steve had kind of an epiphany that, you know, we were a three-piece band and we were loud and we were playing this sort of rockabilly rock sort of stuff. And, you know, ZZ Top was a three-piece band from Texas that was loud and played sort of bluesy stuff. And maybe we could reinvent ourselves into something more like that. And so the idea of, hey, if we, you know, if we keep the three of us together and, you know, with Matt's songwriting ability, we could just be a rock band. And then we're not in a, we're not in a box, you know, then we can do whatever. The goal was to play the bigger rock clubs and not so much the little country bars. All the way up until, you know, the early 2000s. I mean, there was a 10 year period there where there was a fuck ton of bands that were doing gigantic stuff on a, on a national and global scale. And it, I'm not just talking about like Pantera and ZZ Top and those and Stevie Ray Vaughan, but I mean, you had, I could rattle off a laundry list of bands and it seemed like a lot of those bands would, would like, it's kind of like in the rap, in the rap game. You know what I mean? It's like somebody makes it and then they're going to bring up the next artist, so to speak. And I think Dallas was that way. If you look at how it worked for Course of Empire, Trip and Daisy, the Toadies, Hagfish. It was like a southern version of Seattle because everybody was getting signed. And it was, uh, it was kind of a magical time if you think about it. Our first show playing rock music was at Trees and you know we had bought these Marshall Stacks and Les Pauls and electric bass and this huge drum kit and I think we thought people would just, just like it, you know? <laughs> we were wrong. The transition was, I don't know on our part is kind of bananas. You know, we literally from one show to the next. One show, we're like three piece Texas rockabilly band. And then three weeks later, we're supporting, I wanna say, I don't know, it was probably Toadies or, or Ugly Mustard or somebody at Trees. And it was like, no, we're a rock band now. We're not playing any of the old material. Here's a bunch of brand new songs we wrote. And we've got this huge double bass Tama kit and, you know, MPEG stacks and Marshall stacks and Matt's out there with the Dean V. And it was like, I don't know what we were thinking. 
Most Lone Star Trio fans did not care for Strap. It's not because Strap was a bad band, but just because they loved Lone Star Trio so much that they couldn't bring themselves to, to get into Strap. I remember doing a show in Houston after we switched to rock music and people just standing in the front row, just giving us the middle finger. And Throwing the lit cigarette at us. It was not cool. Our music was cool. The reaction was not cool. I remember telling them, I was like, listen, you Fonzie motherfuckers. I'm saying this on the mic. We're going to finish this show and we can come off the stage and we can talk about it after that. And I really thought we would have to fight our way out of the club. There were a lot of fights surrounding Strap. I fully expected that our tires would be slashed or something, you know, but... favorite song from Strap was always See You in the Next Life. I always thought that song could be just such a hit. The guitar is so loud and they're and they're just these three dudes and then Chris is just there's just all this insanity going on and we used to do a lot of shows with Strap after we met those guys. I mean it was uh it was a very fast friendship. The things Matt and Steve is they're always growing. They started it's just basically the, you know, just stand up regular guitar, snare drum, typical rockabilly thing. Then they moved out of that because their tastes were expanding and they were around even more rock musicians. They weren't just around those kinds of musicians. Chaz Knight used to do this show for the Eagle here in Dallas called The Local Show. And you got to play, you know, you got to come out and he, he would, you know, it was live and it was super cool. I mean, it was like, it was it was sort of like our our gathering each week, you know. All the bands would come out, support the other bands, and you had two or three bands that would come on, do interviews, and get airplay. And everybody helped everybody back then, and we we were all really close and good friends. And so you could always count on each other. Well, one night we were doing the local show. We got there and set up, and my amp blew. The guys were playing. I think they had just done a set at the green room or something like that, and. Uh, we we found them and they were coming over to watch us anyway and I'm just like hey Matt can I borrow your amp and he goes yeah you can um you know it's it's this you know it's he describes to me what the amp is or whatever and I'm not a gear guy and so I just go look I don't care just something that I could turn on you know and do like through whatever so he just goes um well it's just pretty loud and I'm just like okay that's fine you know whatever we'll 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 figure it out well he brings this amplifier in and I turned that thing on and it had basically one volume. It was either off or so loud that that's all you could hear in the entire room. The numbers all go to 11. This amp was so loud. And so our show was pretty much just my guitar and just people complaining about how loud it was. <laughs> and like the radio station just let go and yeah, we can't, I mean, that none of this is audible. Strap didn't go over that well because people were such huge Lone Star Trio fans because, again, in Dallas at the time, there was a lot, there was a big rockabilly scene and they were sort of the, you know, one of the top tier bands doing it. So if Lone Star Trio played, you went and saw it. When they sort of threw their hat into the rock and roll ring in Dallas, 
I don't think that it wasn't that it wasn't good. It just that they had already kind of grabbed the brass ring of this one sort of genre and they were doing really well. And then they sort of knocked it all down and started over. And it becomes such a very personal thing for people. And they have these expectations and they want you to play that first album over and over and over. A lot of it has to do with the music industry. The way the music industry uh, has always been, the artist does their thing. They put out their first breakthrough record or whatever. The public falls in love with it. They like it. And the record company always constantly from that point on wants them to replicate the success of the successful record. There's a relationship that builds between a band and an audience that is a is a trust and the hard part about that is as musicians as artists we're trying to constantly evolve and develop and create and you don't want to get stuck doing the same thing for 30 years you want to do something different and sometimes that's a little hard for your hardcore audience to deal with. I mean, it's an emotional attachment to a time for a lot of people, and they, you know, they have such strong ties to a band for, you know, certain moments in their life that they expect people to stay that way forever. And then, you know, with regards to the Lone Star Trio, I mean, like, you know, I mean, they were just below. I mean, and, and people have known Matt since he was a child. I mean, like a little child going out and doing that. So then there's like some kind of, you know, People have people, I think, take owners try to take an ownership of that and don't realize, you know, that that 13 year old kid is now 25 and now he's 30, you know, and it's, you know, they, they want to grow. I think that the Lone Star Trio folks just uh, that fan base, they just didn't get it. And we knew that they were never going to get it because we all, you know, certain genres of music can become really clicky. And especially back then, like, it's not like today. You know what I mean? When you think about today, it's. You know, there are country artists out there that rap and there's there's, you know, pop bands that maybe have a country sensibility to them or there's a lot of, you know, these kind of like melding of of like it's electronica, but it's got crazy drum programming. It sounds like a metal band, like all that is pretty ubiquitous now. Back then it wasn't like this was your genre and you stayed in your lane and even though with Lone Star Trio, I think we were, we always had this heavy element that, that I had brought in, you know, I guess either on purpose or not on purpose, but that's just kind of where I was coming from musically, as far as like double bass stuff and, and just kind of like a more passionate kind of aggressive style of playing. So it was always there, but we still kind of adhered to that rockabilly kind of aesthetic and, 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 and sensibility musically. Being good friends with the guys at the time, it's sort of a, like a really hard thing to witness because I know, you know, they've, they've always been such passionate musicians and artists and creatives that they put everything into it. And I remember, you know, them writing these songs and being around them while it was going on and for it to sort of not hit the mark that they wanted to hit was pretty devastating for him at the time. It was pretty quick. Everybody was just all of a sudden, fuck those guys. The benefit of that was that the kind of music we were writing with Strap, which was, you know, heavy rock, Texas three piece with Matt's songwriting skills of, uh, which is just amazing pop rock songs, that that actually broadened the audience. Back in those days when you were booking gigs, you had to have a demo tape and we didn't have any recordings with Strap. And we were on the road in California, and Linda Jemison was able to book us some studio time. And our friend Steve Soto produced, produced our first demo. As functional as having a demo tape to book gigs was, we knew that we needed to have a full-length CD. We recorded the Strap CD with Chad Lovell at Course of Empire Studios. Prior to doing the full-length Strap CD, we had never seen Pro Tools or any form of digital recording. Everything we had done up to that point has been on the two inch tape, the one inch tape, whatever kind of tape there is, we recorded on it. But the Strap album was a new thing for all of us. So Chad Lovell and I, you know, he was still in Course of Empire. Hell, they were on TVT, they were touring and he was getting into production and he had done some really cool stuff with some other Dallas bands. Um, that Jive record he did was killer and he did Slow Roosevelt record. 
I had went to Matt and Steve. I'm like, well, ma'am, you know, our friend Chad. The cool thing that, that with him, it wasn't just like, hey, we're just going to record. So this is 96. Pro Tools isn't a thing. You know, programming drums, all this kind of stuff is not a thing. And he was, he dove headfirst into that shit. What other bands like Nine Inch Nails and Filter and kind of more industrial bands at the time were doing, which was the quick explanation is this. Basically, you program you know, the kit, and then you put live cymbals over it, which is totally common now. A million bands do it, but back then it was like kind of cutting edge. I am proud of all the work we did, and, and you listen to it now, and the songs are still there. You know, those songs are timeless, so. And for me, that's, you know, that's the most important thing. A great song can transcend a genre, and it can stick around forever. We're From Texas was a Lone Star Trio song, turned into a Strap song, and later turned into an 1100 Springs song. Uh, 1100 Springs also did a couple of Strap songs that you probably recognize. Um, Thunderbird will do just fine, and see you in the next live. While Strap was still a band, uh, Steve and I decided we wanted to put something together to make a little extra money playing country music. So we talked to our friend Richie Vasquez, and. Uh, just started playing some country gigs at Eight Airs on Monday nights. Monday nights at Eight Airs started out as a total ghost town. The only people at Eight Airs on a Monday night then were like these crotchety old bar regulars. And so when we came in with our long hair and tattoos and stuff like that, and it was more of a novelty back then than it is now, and they didn't know what to think about us. My grandma, bless her heart, she had all them old records back at the farm. And we'd listen to Merle, we'd listen to Waylon, and uh, we'd listen to Hank. And she'd always say, you know what, that, that Willie, I just don't like the way he looks, but I sure do love his music. And that's what I tell those guys. I said, hey, you, don't have to, you don't have to like the way they look, man, but I mean, listen to the music. And I think that long-haired, tattooed, hippie freak really gets it. This song goes out to all those folks out there, and I mean everybody. It don't matter where you come from, what you do for a living, how much money you make, if you're a man or woman, if you're black or white, it don't make no difference, cause we're all the same. We're all just a bunch of long-haired, tattooed, hippie freaks. There would be like four or five guys, and they would be all in a circle and drinking, and every once in a while peeking over their shoulder and giving Matt and Steve the stink eye. But uh, after a while, they, they would play some song that really hit with them. And then, you know, they would say, hey, you know, hey, that's that ain't so bad over there. I mean, come on. For about two years, we've been down here every Monday night with these guys. And it started out and it was Matt and Steve and me and a couple other guys. And now there's a bunch of y'all here and we appreciate the support because these guys, are, uh, they're carrying on a country tradition. 
Monday nights. You know, you guys are a bunch of misfits. You realize that, right? their Saturday night and they would come in and a lot of them were our, some of our rock and roll friends so they kind of looked weird <laughs> too uh, but then some folks with cowboy hats started coming in and college kids started coming in and it turned into this really diverse scene every single Monday night in the early days it was just a residency that we were doing every Monday night um, and there wasn't even a whole lot of thought into recording at all. It was something we were doing for fun. And we sold a $5 cassette tape, and that turned into t-shirts, and the t-shirts turned into a studio CD. Uh, but getting into the studios and recording a CD was always just kind of a, I always sort of felt like it was a means to an end as far as being able to, to play more live shows. Making a connection with people and enjoying each other, you know, on stage and being able to, to sort of do a good performance and that's really what it's all about. A thing that seems to really fall on deaf ears with with modern rockabilly acts is at least in texas we all had heavy heavy billy influence in our rockabilly we were all country guys at heart we all had uh we all loved you know upbeat country shuffles and stuff like that so that was pretty much where we were going to land if we didn't become a punk rocker and if we didn't die in a fiery rockabilly car crash. Well, Lebanon Springs was doing their brand of traditional country music and honky-tonk at a weekly residency at Eight Air Saloon in Dallas, Deep Ellum District. I know it well. I have to share that history and a rite of passage with that band. Here's band leader, my buddy Matt Hillier, with the story behind a tune that dates back to those early years. Raise hell, drink beer. Uh, Raise hell, drink beer is one of uh, the sort of signature songs that Eleven Hurt Springs has. We've been at it for a good long time, and I say that this is probably the second song that I ever wrote for this band. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's about my dad. Uh, my dad grew up in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. I mean, the, <laughs> the words of the song will tell you exactly what I'm probably about to say, but uh, he grew up in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, and just being young teenagers in, in Bartlesville, you couldn't get uh, full strength beer. So they would drive to Caney, Kansas. And, uh, and have a good time. And they had a little group called the Bartlesville Beer Drinkers. And it's funny because uh, uh, recently I was uh, helping my mom move and going through all this stuff. And I, I found an old t-shirt and look at it. It's got all this markings and stuff from Sharpie and whatever on, on the shirt. And it was my dad's from high school and it said Bartlesville Beer, Beer Drinkers 1962 or whatever. Uh, it said raise hell drink beer on it. I'm gonna get it framed at some point in time, but it's pretty pretty cool It's it's a it's one of the staple songs for 1100 Springs Well, my daddy grew up in a small town in Oklahoma They'd Say there wasn't much for a growing born to do Except to drive around town with all of us friends on the weekend And go searching for a case of beer that wasn't 3 2 He used to drive around town in a no 1960 Corvair Yeah, my oldest friends are called us of the BBD 
But when I asked him what those the three initials stood for He said in Bartlesville, beer, drink a son, so what it means Well, it's hell, drink beer, that's the only with the deer around here I Get your kicks, say some chicks, I ain't ready to do it every day of the year He said, no one of these days I'm gonna leave this town And you won't find me anywhere near But for now, I keep a raising hell and drinking beer That's right, so hell, come on When it was time to record the first 1100 Spring CD, we went to Reed Easterwood, a friend of ours who had played with a lot of, a lot of folks we knew. And um, he had a sort of like a home studio, which, I mean, it, it was in a home. I don't know about being a studio, really. But uh, he had this half-inch reel-to-reel tape, and it would break down regularly, and it seemed like he was the only person that could fix it. It's kind of like this mad scientist. I don't, I've always been into recording music since my teens in, in whatever form there was to record music with. But watching Reed do his thing on the first 1100 Springs album uh, definitely showed that you could make a lot with a little. Reed was really cool though, man. He's just, you know, just a, such an out there type dude in the kind of way that we really dug and understood. And he had an ear for it. And that's been a theme with a lot of the people that we've worked with on recording projects. It's not so much the room that you're doing it in, it's the guy who's um, working the gear at the time. And he he really was able to find just some cool sounds and what became Welcome to 1100 Springs. <laughs> When we released Welcome to 1100 Springs, it was really cool because by the time we actually released it, there was just a whole bunch of people who wanted to buy this thing. People were digging the songs, you know, that's one thing that's cool is about making a record. Is that the idea is you make this record, people take it home and they listen to it and they learn the songs and they come back and sing along. That was all happening. Man, it felt really, really good. A long-standing tradition with a lot of the old 50s rock and rollers is that you just supply a backing band for them and they should just know all the hits. So immediately when we booked Bo Diddley, I thought, oh, you know, Matt and Steve can handle this. We didn't get any kind of communication from Bo Diddley's camp at all. They didn't tell us what songs we'd be playing. So we set up at the Doll Hut, stayed there all night learning Bo Diddley's greatest hits. I mustered up the courage to introduce myself to Bo Diddley in this trailer that they had for him where the AC wasn't turned on and uh, none of his drinks were iced down. And uh, I mean, I don't know, it's not like he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or anything. But I, w I walked up and said, hey, I'm with the band and, you know, we learned up all your hits. And he uh, looked at me and said, well, we ain't gonna play none of that shit. And so I was like, great, cool. Why would you want to play the hits, you know? What are we going to do? The backstage thing at the Hootenanny was not perfect. Uh, Bo's trailer was hot. The beer was hot. Mike Ness was on stage, and the stage was set up in the sense that they would just sort of go back and forth. It's one big stage, but we're on this side setting up. We're going on after Mike Ness, and uh, Mike Ness is doing his thing over here. And, of course, he's one of the biggest things ever to come out of Southern California. Mike Ness is finishing up his set, and I could see Bo Diddley on the steps of his trailer not making his way to the stage, and Mike Ness had worked the audience into a fever pitch. And uh, so well, we're just waiting for Bo to get on stage and get ready to do the show and all of that, but he, he's just standing there, and people are trying to get him to make his way to the stage. So it was showtime, but the show was on hold because Bo Diddley had some V-neck t-shirts in his rider for a very good reason. It was hot outside, he's gonna need something to change into after the show. So the t-shirts were not there, so the show was on hold. And I'm not, you know, authorized to speak on his behalf by any means, but given his history in the music business, give the man his t-shirts. And come showtime, there were no t-shirts. So if somebody can't bring you a t-shirt, can they bring you the money? So he finally gets on stage, and keep in mind, we have no idea what we're about to play. And the way that that went down was basically that he would just turn around 
uh, to our drummer Bruce and just sort of um, mime what he wanted Bruce to play and then we would just sort of follow him and I think he did some raps and some kind of cool dance moves. It was just cool. Things were going really well. Our crowds were strong uh, and the radio was starting to play our music. We had used Chris Clarity on a handful of gigs here and there, and uh, he's just one of those guitar players that you only have to tell him the key, and he just puts all kinds of good stuff onto the song. And he, I, we knew him from playing with Jack Ingram, and of course he had a band called Fever in the Funk House, and he had been around the scene for a long, long time. So when it became possible for us to, to get him to join up with us, we did it with a quickness. So the time had come where we needed a new drummer, and I was doing this weeknight gig with Mark Reznicek, at the time, formerly of the Toadies, because they had broken up. So it was about that time that I hit up Matt uh, and just, you know, bounced the idea off him. We want to see if Mark wants to join the band. I had some misgivings because I had never really played country music before. I'd listened to it, but uh, my muscle memory didn't really extend to playing in that style it was a little bit of a learning curve but you know what better way to do it than in front of people <laughs> screwing up in front of a whole bar full of drunks uh, but i eventually got the hang of it and, you know i was around for six years or something chris clarity had a sort of a home studio set up and Steve had this idea that we could go in there with some good microphones and record like classic country songs, just mainly just for fun. But it turns out I had a handful of uh, new original songs, and we went in there, we recorded what became the record, A Straighter Line. That was also when we brought back the two Strap songs, See You in the Next Life and Thunderbird Will Do Just Fine. All right, I don't know if y'all are ready for this. I don't know if it'll make it on TV or nothing. Roll up another joint. One more time to clear my head. And I'll get right to the point. I better stop feeling better and better off dead. Put some ice in a Dixie cup. I pass the whiskey over here Take that joint and fire it up And if there ain't no whiskey, pass the beer A straighter line record it really has its own personality and I think it's because it's so stripped down. Most of the, the sounds you hear are, are acoustic and I think that was out of necessity because we didn't really have a full studio. Recording the Straighter Line album over at Chris Clarity's home studio really made me think of those early days with Lone Star Trio, recording our own stuff on cassettes of the Texas Tube Room and their reel-to-reel -reel setup, uh, those funky 8-track cassette format recordings that we did, and the first 1100 Springs album with Reed Easterwood and his reel-to-reel -reel machine. The common thread that connects all that is you don't need a whole lot of expensive stuff to do something really cool. Seeing the next life from a straighter line was the first time we actually had a song that just organically started getting its own radio play. You asked me if I wanted my jacket back, you know it looks better on you. Said, what about your favorite shirt? You said, I could keep that too. I said, I'll see you next time. But baby, I don't know when. Can't help but feel like crying It'll never be the same again You like Barbara Streisand I don't like her at all You like to laugh at people Whenever they trip and fall You don't like the way I drive You're always trying to change my hair I guess I didn't think I'd notice I guess I didn't think I'd care I could say we both saw it coming. We got with Chris Thomas over at Paladuro Records, and initially he wanted to just re-release the Straighter Line album, but eventually we agreed to record in a similar style to that. And that became the record bandwagon. On the bandwagon recording, we split it into two distinct sessions at two separate studios. The first half was recorded at a warehouse studio owned by Peter Schmidt 
uh, engineered by Stuart Sykes, and we recorded, I don't know, eight or ten songs there, some of which never saw the light of day. They're great songs, we just didn't use them on this album. He had just gotten done doing the Loretta Lynn Jack White record. Recording with Stuart Sykes in that warehouse was, was fun, but it was also just kind of weird because there wasn't an actual control room. There was a latency between that we had to work around. The, the room itself would get kind of cold. And um, so, but he, he was great to work with. The remainder of the sessions for Bandwagon were cut at Cherry Ridge in Floresville with Tommy Dedamore. And uh, Tommy had produced the last Doug Som record, The Return of Wayne Douglas. And if there was a record that came out that year that uh, we looked to as an example of where we wanted to, to land, it was that record. The hit song off that album, While You've Been Gone So Long, includes uh, Ronnie Dawson's vocal track that I recorded on a cassette tape in 1993 or 94. Bandwagon was pretty well received right off the bat, and uh, that period of time also marks a, a lineup change in the band. Uh, Mark Resnicek was on drums. Chris Clarity was no longer with us, and that point we wanted a fiddle player. And that's when Jordan Hendricks enters the picture. I wanted to be in Texas music. I knew that after, when I graduated, I wanted to be in Texas. This is the year after. And I remembered them and I was just like, you know what? I, I don't remember them having a fiddle player and, uh, uh, you know, websites and stuff were still, you know, technically kind of brand new, you know, band websites and stuff. But I went to their website and I just, you know, I sent them an email and lo and behold, I have the email right here and I'll just go ahead and read it for you to wear my glasses because I'm old now. Hey guys, my name is Jordan Hendricks, and I am 26 years old, and I really dig your style of music. And if by any chance you're looking for a badass fiddle player, all caps, in the future, please let me know. My style of fiddling and the style that your band plays are very similar. If there are any auditions open, please let me know. Many, many, many thanks. For some reason, I thought if I put that in there, they would really reach out to me, I guess. And you know, the nice thing about it is, you know, Steve, Steve Berg, our, our bass player, was the one who reached out to me. And he wrote me, he's like, hey, Jordan, when do you want to come over and audition? Or at least get together and talk about it. I mean, that's that's pretty welcoming. We are in the North Dallas area. Are you in the DFW area? <laughs> no. <laughs> Honestly, I thought I had my two uh, older brothers were living in Austin at the time. I thought they were, most Texas music bands were out of Austin. They're, I didn't know there was a whole, you know, music scene in itself up here in Dallas, Fort Worth. So my, my, my immediate reaction was like, I moved to Dallas. But uh, I said, they set up an audition for me down at Threadgills in Austin. This is probably like uh, that same month, October of 04. And uh, I totally thought I bombed it. The humorous nature of Jordan's email kind of piqued our interest and Steve and I had a good chuckle about it. But we decided to give him a call. I graduated. And then the next week I was playing floor country store in Holotus. That was, that was, and that, I mean, I just hung the moon when they took me on the road with them the next weekend. Starting to play more and more sold out shows, and it, uh, I don't know, it felt like we were kind of arriving. With the support of Paladura Records, we we're really feeling good. We we're having some upward momentum and just really feeling great about the bandwagon release. We were going down to Austin to play at the Continental Club one night. And somebody said, Turn on the radio. <laughs> Tell me, baby, why you've been gone so long? You've been gone so long. And it just felt really good. It was like something out of a movie. We played the show that night and it was sold out. All of a sudden you feel like a fully realized band.
I got a call in the middle of the night and they told me that Steve had been in a really bad motorcycle wreck and we didn't know what his fate was going to be. So the wreck was bad. It was one of those, is he alive, is he dead? Bad, that bad. It's bad where you take the helicopter ride to Parkland ICU, which is a great place to save your life, but not the greatest place to stay afterwards. That just kind of spun my whole world out. Because, um, you know, he's, he's my business partner, he's my best friend. Uh, we lean on each other for everything, and he's lying there, and I can't really do a damn thing to help him. So at Parkland ICU, it was a bad scene. It was touch and go, and even when I came to, you know, I didn't know where this thing was going to land. Um, so talk about pulling the rug out from under you in, in every aspect. Once again, the music community stepped up to help out, and that's just a beautiful thing when it happens. It just reminds you of just how the sense of togetherness that exists in our music world, and it, I, really helps when we didn't have health insurance. Pretty much instantly, wheels were set in motion to start raising money for Steve. And uh, there was a big benefit show that happened. Steve had been doing some DJ gigs and his DJ name was DJ Burlap. And so when they did the benefit, it was they called it Save DJ Burlap. And it was just amazing to see how many people uh, signed up to play and then how many people just showed up just because they heard about it. Musicians that you know came in from out of town. Bill Joe Shaver played, Tommy Alverson played, Rusty Weir played, um, I know Ed Burleson played, uh, Jason Bolton and the Stragglers just showed up, Doug Moreland's band showed up. I'm sure I'm leaving people out here, but it was overwhelming, the outpouring of love. And just knowing that that was going on, that's a humbling experience that uh, I'm not gonna forget, and if anything like that ever happens to you, I promise you'll never forget it. With Steve being the one that handles as much of the business as he does, I was really pretty lost without him. Um, you know, not just on the business end, but just, you know, I was worried about my, about my friend. And I'd only been in the band for a year, and uh, Matt and I kind of both leaned on each other and uh, to, to help him out, help him. He, he got well and everything, I think, back for the summer of, uh, for the summer of 06, he was, he was kind of back and going, but uh, he had to have some major surgeries and stuff like that. The efforts that it took for me to get my life back on some kind of track w was no small feat. But nonetheless, it was time to get back to work, and it was time to make an album so we could get back to work. That's where the Country Jam album comes into play. When life struggles have got you down and seems a friend just can't be found. to make another record and began production on the Country Jam album. First album I, I played on them with was in 2008 and uh, Lloyd Maines was the producer, Natalie Maines' father, and uh, I wasn't rehearsed. I was still pretty, you know, green back then. And uh, Lloyd's a great producer. He'll get anything out of it. I mean, he's, he's that good. I did some stuff I didn't even know I could do, but he's, that's that's a mark of a good producer. We had already recorded a Lone Star beer commercial with him previous to that, and uh, it was cool working with him. And then to actually record an album with him, uh, his style of recording was amazing. Uh, he would sit in his own soundproof booth with his acoustic guitar, and he would learn the arrangement and he would play along with you while you're recording. And then at the end, he'd say, you can keep my acoustic or or not, whatever you want. Like, it's just part of his process to, to get into the song.
lobbies you heard the noise I make Well, let me introduce my new Rocket 88 Yes, it's great, just won't wait Everybody likes my Rocket 88 Baby, we'll ride in style, moving on along The whole band is, you know, if you looked at them, you, you wouldn't think that you're going to get that sound out of them. But they're some of the truest uh, to form country guys. I mean, they, they know exactly what country music should sound like and they, they achieve it. I've been uh, playing shows with Matt for a long time. I remember meeting him a long time ago at 1100 Springs and just blown away by their, their whole vibe, their whole energy. Stop the music, let it play one more song, the same one it's played tonight for so long. After we recorded Country Jam, Paladero Records, like so many other record labels at that time, found the music business unsustainable. So there went our record label. So don't stop the music, let it play one more song, the same one it's played tonight for so long. My pockets are empty. I spent my last time, but I've just got a fear. So one more time. So don't stop the music. Let it play one more song. The same ones play tonight. We worked out a deal with Smith Music Group to record and release this crazy life. that the Lord has made Another night that they put me to bed Another train running through my head a Cup of coffee and a cigarette 500 miles to go just yet Heading off to someplace new A thousand places ain't none of them you Don't you know Don't you know Someday I'm gonna settle down and sleep in our bed our town. Kiss the babies every night when they go to bed. Vacation every summer on the coast and raise a glass and drink a toast to the days gone by when I was really out of my head. But until then, it's this crazy life instead. We spent the next few years grinding it out working band, making albums, regional tours, West Coast tours, playing every show we could. I think we all felt like we had a second chance, and so we doubled down on the work. Back in 2017, Chad, Ray, and Christian joined the band. And we did the Finer Things album. I got a call from Matt Hillier, and when he offered me the job of playing drums in the band, he said a couple things. And one was, look, what we play is traditional country music. We play real country music, and our goal is to put out the albums we want to put out, make great songs, and get paid. Are you good with all those? <laughs> and, I, and I was like, yeah, that sounds great. You know, playing actual country music with a bunch of great players and, you know, getting a paycheck. It sounds awesome. But uh, Matt and Steve did say early on when I joined that the final um, creation of the group was the final. This was the final one because they have gone through a couple drummers, a couple steel players, some guitar players through the years. So there was kind of that idea, well, there could be some other drummer after me and another guitar player, or, you know, however that may fall. But Steve was pretty clear that, man, this final group is great. There's something really special happening here. And I think 
if we're gonna end, it's gonna be on this high note with these with these guys, and this will be the end. So when it did come to an end, it was uh, kind of surprising, but still kind of um, kind of cool in a way that you know we created something kind of special at the end there, and it'll end on a high note, I think for sure. Throughout the years, with all the recording projects I've been a part of, I've tried to pay attention to what doesn't work, what to avoid, but more importantly, what does work, what engineers to pay attention to what producers really get it done in a way that speaks to me. With Christian's help at his studio, Drum Arsenal Productions, and the work I was able to do putting this room together as a recording studio, we really were able to bring the production home and have me engineer and produce our final album, the Here Tis album, in this very room here at the Cadillac Barn. And I'm proud of the work I did on it. I'm proud of the work everybody did on it. I don't have a lot of money, no one thinks my jokes are funny, and I ain't much to look at, honey, but I got a plan. And I tell you all about it, if you let me be a man. Well, now let me be a man, and I won't ask you anymore. I do all the driving, and I'll open every door. But no one loves you like I do, I'm your biggest fan. And I'll prove it to you, honey, if you let me be your man. Hey. This piece is really cool, and one thing we've, we've tried to do over the years is to create pieces of art uh, for uh, that actually are physical pieces of art for our album covers, and this is no exception. Steve had the foresight whenever Billy Bob's Texas said that they were pulling up their original dance floor to ask them for some of the wood because he wanted to build a guitar out of it, but he had enough left over to where we could create this and have our friend Robert Hamilton do some one-shot paint in tribute to the old Naomi's uh, front window, Naomi's Here Tis, which is where we got our start. So it kind of brings everything full circle. And it's a really cool piece. He did a great job on it. Another brilliant idea Steve had. About halfway through production on the Here Tis album, a unique opportunity just landed in my lap. The next thing you know, 1100 Springs is Joshua Ray Walker's backing band for his album releases. I've been sneaking into their shows since I was in junior high. That night at Sons of Herman Hall was not only amazing because of the show with Josh, but amazing in the sense that it connected us to State Fair Records, who went on to release the Here Tis album. We were already in the process of making Here Tis when we were talking to State Fair about releasing it on their label. And uh, so we were really happy when it actually came to fruition. Not only did State Fair Records release the Here Tis 1100 Springs album, but they've been very instrumental in putting this documentary together behind the scenes. And currently they're working on Matt Hillier's solo album release. I don't think anyone's hanging it up for good. I think it's just the end of an era and a start of something else. Life is full of changes. That's one of the only constants in life is that, that things change. And just because the band is not going to be playing anymore, it's just one more change. I mean, I started, I started making music and writing songs when I was really young. And it's taken me all kinds of places, introduced me to a lot of folks. One of them is Steve Berg, one of my best friends, and we've been able to create uh, something I'm really, really proud of over all the years we've been together. And uh, he'll remain my friend for all my whole life. Chris Matt. Uh, yeah, if I had to sum it up, uh, 1100 Springs up in one word, what I hope it would be, that was one number one, that's really difficult, what I hope it would be, would be authentic. I'm gonna go with friendship. Me and this dude are pretty good friends. And I'd say pretty much uh, most of the friends we have collectively or individually are folks we probably met you know, through sharing our gift of music. Yeah, I like that. I know that's cheesy, but uh, yeah, for real, we've, we've met some good people over the years. It's true. It's true. Most people who have been doing music as long as we have, uh, the, the message I, I would guess would be the same is that you start in one spot thinking that you're, you know, you're in the trenches and you're everybody, it's everybody for everybody and, and uh, and it still is that way, but at the same time, um, you're you're on a path and you're going someplace. And in the end, if uh, if you look in, over your shoulder, the things that last and things that matter to me are the relationships that you sort of uh, cultivate with the, with the fans or other musicians, the people that you meet um, that uh, that share the sort of journey with you. That's it, you know. Certainly not the money that you make playing in the music business. <laughs> Although I'm happy that we do get to 
get paid for what we do, but at the same time, it's uh, it's always relationships. And I believe that's probably true for just about anything you do in life. If what, what ends up being worthwhile is the people that you meet. Maybe I would have done things differently, you know, knowing now what I know then, I'm sure I probably would have done a few things differently, but really looking back, I wouldn't change anything because it, it brought us here today, you know. You, you gotta make a few mistakes to, to learn a few things. you to the bone or oh, that time orange and blue in the desert I remember the kind of heat that makes you pray for home I'm sure we would have got a room if we'd have had a dime to spare there wasn't too much money in those days we slept on dirty floors and couches and we never seen the care And we did the gig no matter what it paid When we stepped out on the stage Troubles faded all away We put everything we had into the sound We walked for miles to a trailer And we were met by double barrels at the door She let us use her phone And we left her all alone Things like that don't happen anymore After all this time I know from every mile to every show the price you have to pay for living free Sleeping in a motel bed When I could be home instead Dreaming about the way things used to be Sometimes I've never been in a band that was more professional and took care of their bandmates like, like this band. I mean, it's just a treasure. It's like going to work on the Starship Enterprise, you know. You, Captain Picard's gonna take care of it. These guys are just great guys. They write really good songs. They take a lot of care in their music. And uh, they rehearse. And uh, they play on most of the, all the big shows in the area, you know, all the festivals. And so it's just been a really, really good experience. Highlights, wow. There's so many. The big one for me would probably be our trip to France in December 2012. That was actually my first time going to Europe. So besides all the culture shock of just being in a foreign country, the reception we got over there was amazing. It was amazing to experience the culture. That's the greatest thing about it is that we get to meet all these cool people and uh, get out and see new places and everything like that. We did our part in uh, in, in showing out as for, uh, for America and for Texas in general, for sure. With, uh, you know, we're walking through the streets of Paris with cowboy boots and everything and you know obviously looking out of place but <laughs> i think i remember people yelling at us hey cowboys you know <laughs> you should hear him trying to speak french to people it's, <laughs> it's actually italian it's an english speaking italian accent. he told this lady donka shame <laughs> <laughs> i wanted to say thank you but in the wrong language they have such a great uh 
way of entertaining you and, and keeping you into it, yet having a great deal of substance. Not only did I like their music um, and their authenticity and what they sang about and everything from, you know, we'll drink all your beer and steal your, steal your girls to um, nobody told you about the love. You know, they play like they're brothers and in a lot of ways they interact as people outside of a band as brothers as well. I'm just glad to be part of the Texas music scene, period. Because uh, if you stick around long enough, it, it, the people around you really are like your family. What we have to look at is um, a, a solid legacy. Uh, making your mark uh, for, your, for your own, with your own voice, you know. And that's something we're real proud of. We walked for miles to a trailer And we were met by double barrels at the door She let us use her phone And we left her all alone Things like that don't happen anymore After all this time I know from every mile to every show The price you have to pay for Free. Sleeping in a motel bed when I could be home instead. Dreaming about the way things used to be. Sometimes I step out on the stage and my mind turns back to pace. And the music takes me back to that place. Thoughts of people come and go like the tide. Across my face Looking back I can see us now When we were only learning how With no idea what each new day would bring And if every foolish choice Was what it took to find our voice Looking back I wouldn't change a thing Looking back I wouldn't change a thing Reasons that the 